Welcome to Let's Talk Humanitarian. Parlons humanitaire, enriching conversations with humanitarian workers and humanitarian leaders to open eyes, heart, and mind. This is a program by Kalyu Institute, your online center of humanitarian studies, where humanitarians train humanitarians. My name is Amelie Yangwifest, and I'm so delighted to be your host today for this conversation with Jorge Castilla from World Health Organization. Hi, Jorge. Thank you for being with us today. Hi, Amelie. So happy to see you. Jorge, before we, we, we dive into our topic and we listen to you to, to tell us more about public health, about emergencies, about your commitment to a healthier world, and I would like to introduce uh, you a little because you, you have such a vast experience. Uh, more than 25 years, I think we can even go up to 30 no? years of uh, medical humanitarian assistance with NGOs, with donors, with UN, with ministries of health. You started as a general physician in a Colombian rural hospital. You are Colombian? Yep. Yeah. Uh, then you were district health director, regional director of epidemiology, and with the Ministry of Health in Colombia. That's where you started your, your, your career. Um, then you went to Sudan as project coordinator, and uh, you have worked in, on more than eight humanitarian projects in that country. Uh, you worked then on a sleeping sickness program in Uganda. Also, you published many publications on that topic. Uh, you've been country manager for many humanitarian medical programs in Uganda, Sair. You took care of the reception of arriving refugees uh, from Rwanda, Zairean, Ugandan, and Sudanese um, refugees. You handled epidemics of cholera, meningitis, and missiles. You were the country manager also for medical programs in Mozambique. Um, so many countries, then regional medical coordinator, that's where we met, you know, you with ECHO, so the humanitarian aid um, department of the European Union. You've been in West Africa with them during four years, conflict, post-conflict, refugee epidemic and nutritional project in 17 countries. You've been also the focal point for ECHO for malaria and epidemics. And then you joined WHO mm. after ECHO. Okay, and how many years in WHO? So it's curious because let me let me begin already to tell you a bit. I, I feel I'm very fortunate for two reasons. Number one, my life has taken me to the key events of the evolution of, of the humanitarian world. And it has been yeah. a, a luxury to be there by chance, by pure chance. The second is that I have been able to see emergencies from the perspective of a government an NGO, mm -hmm. a donor, and a UN uh, organization. So it has been a, a, a learning trip, and I, I like to learn, so I'm, I'm delighted. And for WHO, I have been there twice, and for ECHO, the same. So, and, and it's good. You don't, you don't need to be uh, only with one organization, because if the idea is to help people, there are many ways to help the people. So uh, initial work with WHO was... Uh, um, at the regional level in charge of uh, refugee and displacement program. And in this contract that is separated from the other one for many years, it's uh, a current, it has evolved to the last five years, but currently I'm working on protracted crisis, crisis that last a very mm. long time, which is also a, a super interesting area to work. And with ECHO, it was the same. I had one first experience with ECHO and it was really about the region but the, yeah. which was West Africa. And the second experience with ECHO was really worldwide because ECHO decided to have uh, six regional offices, each regional office with a regional uh, doctor, but to ensure coherence and consistency to have a, a global overview. So that's it. Amazing. And, and I love how you, you mentioned um, this journey of, of humanitarian aid, this trip in a very... Um, uh, changing not only the context but the humanitarian aid has evolved a lot. So, would you could you tell us um, 
what what have you observed in this almost 30 years um, in the domain of public health? Okay. What are the big trends that you could share with us? More than public health, I would say it's a bit about the international system. When I when I work in my first mission that was 88 in, in northern Sudan, but afterwards 89 in the in the southern part of the country, it was the idea that there was really no system. So when there was an emergency, the best that you can do is to have a lead organization. So there will be one organization among the UN agencies that will take the lead. And for the specific case of Operation Lifeline Sudan 2, it was UNICEF, who was in a particular moment of its own life because they had just signed the Convention of, of the Rights of the, chi of the Children. And therefore that changed totally their dynamic because they mm -hmm. went from one organization that was non-mandate to a mandated one in which the child becomes the priority, right? Then a second moment was um, the Rwanda genocide. I must confess that I really didn't notice it for a long time because I was so focused on what I was doing in Mozambique that the external world disappeared. You know, it's like a dream. Yeah. You're so much into your... But suddenly I saw in the television the, the bodies coming down from the river outside the country. And I was like in, in, in shock, in total shock. And that I observed there a big change because as many of the Rwandan refugees went to, to DRC, that was called Saire at the time. This is why you say mm -hmm. Saire, but in yeah. fact, the name has changed. They, they, there, there was hundreds of thousands of people and, and hundreds of NGOs trying to manage the guilt of not being, having been able to react or not having reacted to mm -hmm. the genocide. So you have a lot of people with goodwill and with very little knowledge. So, so they did not do a good work, even if their intentions was the best. And the consequences of that was two things. There's fair standards. Yeah. So there are standards. If you want to do something, you need to have quality. Mm -hmm. And the second element was all the training programs on humanitarian aid. That does not exist before. Yeah. People like me that went to humanitarian aid were like abandoning society because it was not a profession and it had no future. It was like becoming a noon, you know. Mm. And, and, and since 1994, it becomes, it becomes a profession because there are studies and all these type of things. Then I witnessed the birth of ECHO. So I was in, in WHO, uh, I, sorry, I was in MSF when we had the first negotiations with, with ECHO, the first director, etc. So it's very funny to, to remember that time. I also saw as the product of the confusion, so... Another confusion, the, the response to the 2004-2005 um, tsunami uh, was that people that died, died in, in the first 72 hours. So people that arrived to help arrived when there was nobody to save, but they were there. And, and somehow the help created the chaos because everybody mm -hmm. was feeling uh, obliged to, to do things, right? People arrived there and, and they created a lot of confusion. The, the, the thing to manage was the cause of so many people. So the humanitarian reform appeared with the clusters and the humanitarian coordinators and the yeah. humanitarian funding. Then I was, I was the health cluster coordinator in Haiti when there was this big earthquake. And there was another shift on the humanitarian system with subgroups, with accountability, with other elements. So I think I've seen it all, I, and just by wow, chance. Yeah. I, mean, I really didn't plan to be uh, as uh, health operations director of, w, uh, of MSF at that time. I really didn't plan to be health cluster, in, and it just happened. It's, it's, it's fascinating, and at the same time, it gives me um, a very positive um, uh, insight that, I mean, we, we are learning our lessons. Somehow, mm -hmm. I mean, still we, we still mess up, and 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 there are still many things to to improve always. Um, but what I hear from the the, the big mistakes and the big uh, omissions, you know, the, the 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 moments where we have failed mm -hmm. um, our mandate of saving and protecting lives, um, we have learned the lesson. I mean, we we've been able to to move forward. So so thank you for 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 sharing that, um, Jorge. Can you tell us nowadays what is your exact role? Okay, so 
while I tell you uh, this, I will also give you a, a compact description of what WHO does, because in Great. fact, in spite that WHO has been there for a long time, the, the overall uh, aim of WHO, which is health, not the absence of disease, etc., is not very practical. And we have now a very practical plan. WHO does three things. It helps the vulnerable, it keeps the world safe, and it improves health. And that mm -hmm. translates on, on, on helping the vulnerable in practice to extend universal coverage so people have access to health. Um, keeping the world safe is about preventing, preparing, and responding to emergencies. And among that, what we are doing now for COVID and Ebola and so many things. And, uh, and improving health is not really about health services. It's about the health determinants, it's about the nutrition. It's about the mental health. It's about the environment. It's about these type of things. So these are the three areas where WHO works and I work in emergency. So as emergencies has the prevention, the preparedness and the response, I work in the response. And there are two very different types of response. There is the acute response to a cyclone. You arrive, you do, and you leave, right? That is an acute response. But there is the response that lasts a long time. So for mm -hmm. example, if there is a, a conflict in the Sahel and it touches a new country like Burkina Faso, the mathematics will tell you that the, the probabilities is that it would last maybe more, maybe less, but a mean of 17 years. And that's a very long time. And if you respond this as an acute response, number one, it's going to be very expensive. Number two, you are not going to be able to fund it. But number three, you are going to destruct a lot of local capacities. So you have to, to, to approach it in a different way. And I'm working on that different way, an approach of, of protracted crisis that delivers health services, but builds as much as possible on the pillars of the local health system. Okay, so I understand that, that uh, this, um, this new way, this new strategy is really much of building on the local system, no? Yeah, you, you, must, you must, somehow you must go by, by, by different steps because the, the first thing that you need is you need people to survive. So you might do things that are harmful because there is a categorical imperative of saving people, right? It's like a, with cancer, you know that you might need to um, apply the medicine, but you will need to have secondary effects, but you accept them because it's worthy because there is a categorical imperative, right? So, so the, that is kind of the first one. The second element is, while you do that, try to avoid things that will be harmful for the future and that will, be, that will be make very difficult the, the recovery. For example, yeah. if there is a, a system for delivery of supplies, try not to bring everything in a parallel system that will destroy the existing system. And the third thing, thing is try to, to make your emergency response in such a way that it will build a, a, a good future, provided yeah. that it does not go against the first imperative of saving people now. Okay, so, so thank you for, for, for sharing that. So when, does it mean that when you are working in emergency, of course, the first objective here is saving lives, but you think about saving lives, already integrating how it's going to re the recovery to be, and how does it link to the development programs in place or the development strategy or the national health strategy? Yeah, in particular, if you know that the probability is, is that this lasts long. So in general, conflicts mm. are, are very long. I think that the only conflict I remember that has been very short was uh, 2008 uh, in Georgia, uh, uh, South Ossetia. It was very, very short. But otherwise, they all last very years. Yeah. And they produce refugees and refugees yeah. remain as refugees for very years. So in those occasions, it is really important to build from the beginning a response that is uh, built on local capacities and when you are very effective, particularly if you are very effective for a long time, you will, with no intention, you will be destroying initiatives that were there and you never saw because you were blind to them because you were so busy, right? So, so what's your advice here? That, that's so important what you're mentioning here. You know, our blindness. No? So how do you put the specs of... of of checking, uh, what is your advice? At which moment? I mean, you go to the field, you're on an emergency. W what, what do you do? Who do you, um, who do you ask questions to? Or how do you do? So, so I would say that for, um, for the, the priorities of the context, 
there are so many things to, to, to do that you are a bit lost among the, so you kind of see what are the three main elements and you try to, to, to address them. And only when they come a bit down, you can enlarge your view to get more and more and more. But it, it depends on being able to control. For example, if it's a, a flood and there is cholera and malaria, you have to solve cholera and malaria first before yeah. thinking on nutrition and so on. But the, the thing is that once you identify one area to work, try to explore what can be done with the local resources and capacities before planning what you're going to bring. So it should not be an analysis of these are the needs and this is what I, I, I need to do. There should be an intermediate step that says these are the needs, these are the potential local capacities, and this is the gap between the two. So that you deliver as much as possible uh, through through this. Let me tell you a story that is incredibly yeah. typical, but but really sad. That there was a number of refugees that went from from Uganda to DRC Zaire at that time. A, a, a project was started in order to deliver health to those refugees, right? And because we were so good and we have learned so much, really the service was really good and the 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 health status became a bit better than that in the surrounding population. So the surrounding population become, became very jealous, right? Yeah. So in order to be able to help them, the services in the camp were open to the surrounding population so they can go to the camp and they can receive services. As a result, all the, all the previous private providers of health that were in the village could not survive because even if the service was supposed to be free, for example, mm -hmm. there were payments under the table, yeah. whereas in the refugee camps, it was high quality and free. And then the political situation that created those refugees was solved and the refugees returned to their area. And therefore, our assistance stopped. And there was a village that had no more resources for health of any type. Mm -hmm. Question, could this have been done better? Could the health of the refugees be subcontracted, subcontracted to the existing capacities in the town. You know, this is yeah. what you say afterwards, but now it's too late. But it's an example that for me, I remember it very strongly and each step seems so useful. And at the end, there is a problem that you created unwillingly. So what I'm hearing, and thank you, Jorge, for this honesty and sharing this, uh, this story, because um, it is, um, it is really much of um, being able also to do this exercise of lessons learned. Yeah, that's, mm -hmm. that, that's really needed and important because now next, uh, I mean, after this story, uh, ne next scenario, you have brought the question and all of your team and all the people who've worked with you. So, so that's so important. And at the same time, I hear, I mean, this, this issue that has been overlooked and that was not thought about. And, and I'm hearing an issue that I, I, I remember maybe 20 years back, we were working on the refugee camps and just providing everything to refugees, high quality. And also we were not talking about, you know, we didn't have so many settings and we didn't have the crisis uh, we we're having in Europe also, et cetera. So, so there was funding and there was these camps and everything, we were working on that. And then the host population was totally forgotten. Mm -hmm. And we, we were creating a, 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 a difference, a huge difference between what was happening in the refugee camp and the local population. And that's what led actually that um, systematically now we look, we arrive, we have a refugee situation or, or, or internally displaced situation. We look at the local population. So by one side, I also hear in your story how immediately you had this, you know, reaction to say, hey, let's not forget the host population. They have challenges uh, uh, in terms of health access. And we want also to create this integration of the refugee and that they don't see that like, uh, because also a refugee camp is always um, a threat on, on, on natural resources and local the local environment. So um, yeah, but you saw, you see how our, our choices on integration backfire. So it, yeah. this is where where I yeah. am working no, now. No, no, how it, can we it, do better? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's uh, it's important to 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 continue the reflection and 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 what I'm hearing. Never think that we have seen it. We have seen the, the problem by all angles. And I guess you know, in in this kind of uh, situation, would you say, Jorge, that would we involve the communities um, more effectively in terms of 
hearing their voices and listening to their suggestions or their, their issues. Do you think that that would have helped? Y yes and no, because in fact, I remember my first three years of, uh, of uh, this type of work, I always work with relatively small populations, so less than 10,000. So, so even if I didn't knew everybody, everybody certainly knew me because I was in bicycle mm -hmm. in the middle of the town, right? Wow. And I, I knew enough people to, to find myself comfortable and to feel I was part of the neighborhood and part of the things. But then you go to places uh, where there have been hundreds of thousands of deaths and millions, and then you can talk with people, but is it representative? Mm -hmm. Do you, if you talk with a man, is he representing the, the family, the elderly, the women, and the children? So it, it it is a nice purpose. It's not so easy to do. And if yeah. you're going to do it, it needs a methodology. It needs a, mm -hmm. a, a, a random a approach to population in order that yeah. whatever you do is representative, right? It is not easy. I, I, I hear you, but when you are with big populations, and these days yeah. there are always big populations. Yeah. Um, with how many people, how many years do you have? So yeah. how many hours do you have? It, it, it is a good yes. intention. It's challenging, yes. So I, what I'm hearing, let's hold this intention and let's be practical, yeah. Because the objective is saving lives. Yeah, uh, yeah definitely. Thank you so much, Jorge, for, for these uh, precious insights. Um, we've been blessed to, uh, I've been blessed to interview you a few weeks back while you were in um, Guinea. Um, dealing with Ebola and, um, and COVID situation. So we're going to listen to you now. And uh, after I have two more questions for you. Sure. Thank you. We, we, we saw you in, 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 and it was so, so interesting and to, 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 to hear you from the field and to see you in the field environment, the typical guest house. In the, and, but then you were waiting for the test of the COVID. So, so what happened? Can you update us on how you're feeling and, and what happened? And the test was positive, so I, I had COVID. And therefore, I, I had to self-insulate. But because my behavior is really very healthy regarding yes. transmission, I did not transmit the disease to anybody. It wow, means that the thanks. disease died with me and I did not contribute to its expansion. And mm. today, I essentially, uh, the, the, my organization, WHO, rented an apartment that I paid, but uh, it was a, a rental for me alone. And I could ask my, my friends to bring things from the market and I was there 10 days. And I worked from there with the, the, the caveat that, number one, this is a kind of... Uh, a bingo, you really don't know what's going to happen. You have like, like a 2% possibility at my age that it goes really bad and it didn't. But okay, still, thanks God. But still mm. I was kept busy working, but I couldn't work for many hours because after mm. two, three hours, I was ex exhausted, right? So, so, and finally I got out from the, from the isolation. I finished my mission. I produced the, the strate strategic, uh, a readiness wow. response plan and it's already in the in the you can't find it in the humanitarian response info it's in french and english it comes with the strategic part it comes with the operational part wow. so it's all so what's the, the name of the document so we go for it the strategic readiness and response plan for ebola in guinea and it comes also with a second document that is the operational guidance and there is an english version and a french version and the idea of this is to provide guidance to all those that work there so that the work is coherent and consistency across borders and across organizations. So we work together all in the same uh, effort uh, with the same key performance indicators. You can add more, but at least we have a commonality of approach. Fantastic. That's a true humanitarian worker. You know, uh, with COVID, isolated in a country that is not yours, and uh, but doing the work and getting things done. So thank you for this uh, amazing inspiration. And um, I would like to finalize this interview with two more personal questions. Sure. Have you ever dreamt of um, or thought at some stage um, to do something else than humanitarian aid? Um, I, I really was not planning to do humanitarian aid. Uh -huh. So in fact, what, what happens here is that contrary to some of the people that I met, 
I, I do not have my plan of where I'm going to be in 20 years. I live very much on the present and I'm very open. And each time you make a choice, there are four doors that closed, but five that are going to open in a particular direction. And then you make another choice. So it's a bit like flowing like water. So I really didn't push my evolution. I followed my evolution. So I could have done something else. I, it just happens that I made my choices and I'm here. But it's not like I tried to be here. No. Uh -huh. So you just happen to be here and, and it just fulfilled your life. Me meaning I, I take one decision after the other and let's see what happens, you know. But okay. I, I, I took these decisions like in, in full conscious. So I'm quite happy. <laughs> okay, beautiful. And um, my last question would be, you know, we uh, Calio Institute has uh, thousands of students on uh, its master on humanitarian aid and international cooperation from all over the world. So with these um, 30 years um, of experience that you have in so many contexts and all this wealth of knowledge, of experience, of commitment, um, what would be the one piece of advice you would give to our students so they other humanitarians um, who are watching us right now? Okay, so, so th there will be many, many ways to answer that question, but I will, I will answer it in the following way. Each time you do something, there are three elements that you have to take in account, and if you take only one or two of them, what you do is imbalanced. So, mm. and, and I, co I call them in English, the hands, the heart, and, 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 and the head. Or I would call it in French, in French, intense just the context, meaning that in, in terms of the hands, right, or the gesture, it means that you have to be professional. There is a technicality to apply, right? Mm. You cannot only, in, in the heart or the intention is that you need to have compassion mm. and, and to understand. Somehow, in order to be a good professional, you need to have a, a compassion that leads you to indignation and then it gives you the force to do something about it, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the last one that is the head or the context is to understand the environment in which you are. If you don't balance this three, if you do only intention, for example, you can waste mm -hmm. money or you can be manipulated. If you only have the context, you will be the manipulator. If you only uh, do the jest or the, or the hands, you're a tool. So somehow you have to balance this three to be a technical person is not enough. You need to understand the environment and you need to have a philosophical and moral uh, intention or understanding. Wow, that's beautiful and, and very moving and, and definitely yes, a, a, a powerful uh, mm. piece of advice. Thank you so much, Jorge, um, for, for this interview. Jorge Castilla from the World Health Organization, a senior health advisor. Thank you so much. I think you've inspired and you've enlightened many of us um, with your experience and, and with your advice. So um, thank you for your time, for your energy, and, um, and see you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you, Jorge, for uh, being uh, with us from the field. Um, I, I understand you are in Guinea. You're going to give us the, the details just now. And um, I've heard also you, you have some fever and expecting a COVID test result. Yeah, the, the flight was a bit scary because there had been uh, sandstorms in the Sahel. Uh -huh. Therefore, there were five flight cancellations and the airplane was totally full with very nervous people that were shouting. And uh, wow. I found the, the flight quite scary. So yeah, I, uh, one, one week after I begin to do high fever and I'm waiting for the result of the tests. Okay, so, so we, we, we just hope that the results are positive, but uh, thank you for being here in these conditions with us from the field on your yeah. Sunday, which I understand is, is just the, the little moment uh, you have available. I can see in the background, you're in the hotel or guest house where you're staying. Yeah. So that, that's really... Hmm, that's really a, um, a blessing and an inspiration to, to have this interview with you from the field. So tell us, what are you doing in Guinea as a senior health advisor for WHO? So, so there, there was uh, in 2014 a huge 
outbreak of Ebola in this region with 11,000 uh, deaths. And uh, recently, in the 13th of February, there were a number of, of Ebola. In this moment, there are 18 between confirmed and 14 confirmed, four that are suspected that are, are already cannot really know where if they were, but we can assume they were positive. So let's say 18 cases. It's in a very localized area of Guinea. And uh, I think John, like new therapeutics, like uh, understanding the importance of community engagement so people participate and understand. I think we are in a much better position. And, and my specific role is to help them to plan operations. So I will, okay. uh, I am meeting with the different uh, operational response, like treatment, like infection prevention and control, coordination, laboratory, logistics, and try to, to, to help them on deciding what are they going to do? What will they require to do that? How much will it cost? So we can come with a plan and it's quite advanced. I think that for next week, we will have the strategic plan that will allow countries and partners to be aligned on, on one common way of proceeding. And it took some time because you need to be fast by one side, but you need to be inclusive because this is a public show about Guinea's multi-country, multi-partner, uh -huh. and that's it. Okay, so um, thank you, Jorge. So you, you working directly with the national and local health authorities? Is that, are there the direct partners you're supporting? Yes, I also work with, with the countries. So Sierra Leone, Liberia, Cote d'Ivoire, Mali, Senegal, uh, we are all working together in order to be able also to plan what are the activities that are necessary in the borders, that uh, there are alerts that are, uh, uh, made in the borders with uh, confirmation and so on. Go ahead. Wow, amazing. So, so are you saying that, that from all these countries, I mean, the, the ministries of health are, are really having this uh, joint work together? Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, uh, there was uh, a Wednesday last week, there was a, a, a virtual meeting like everybody, everything in these days, among the Ministry of, of Health of all the countries around. And the same happens regularly between the WHO office, but we have uh, yeah, the countries indeed. Excellent, excellent. And, and so your, your, um, what is your exact role in that? I mean, you, you're just uh, helping people to get together, get a structure, and, and um, what, what, uh, what is your role? So, so in the way WHO has developed since 2014, when there is a new emergency, uh, WHO responds with something called the incident management system, in which there are health operations, but they are supported by a, a, an overall manager that brings together finances, logistics, uh, security, all these pillars of the response together. And among the, the functions of coordination, there is the planning, so people can, in a very systematic way, prepare and make sure that whatever is necessary will be there. That's my function, the planning. Okay, excellent. And um, because then you, you're you working on Ebola, no? so all this program is, and your mission is focused on Ebola, but then there's COVID at the same time. How 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 do you manage both of, of, of the this public health crisis? So in fact, you have to build on it. Whatever has been done uh, for COVID, whatever partnerships authorities have already done, must be the base of what is going to be done uh, specifically for Ebola. And it helps already a lot. Okay. Well, that's good. And, and that's really, I mean, we always say it's sometimes a little cliche, but there's always an opportunity in a crisis. But that's so true, actually, mm. in the facts. You know, you, you have the COVID, which is a crisis. It's heavy for the country, but in, it enables all these mechanisms to be ready and people open to coordination and, and uh, having some experience already of... Uh, cross-border work. Wow, truly inspiring. So, so when, how long is this mission for you? It's relatively short. I should, I should be done by the 18th of, of March. By the time everybody will have their own uh, aligned plans. It's not so, matter, it's so much a matter of having the, the plan. And you know that plans, uh, what is important is the planning process rather than the plans because the situation will change. 
But mm. the fact of, of working this allow people to align. Everybody's working on yes. points of entry. Everybody's the logistics necessary to vaccinate. You know, it, this is ultra cold chain because these are vaccines like uh, the Pfizer vaccine for COVID needs very, very low temperatures. Everybody is working on safe and dignified uh, um, burials. And mainly, mainly the big lesson from the past, everybody is working on community engagement which starts by listening. It's one of the main components, the community engagement and the listening and the local culture and the anthropology and so on. Wow. I think that that's really, that's really powerful words I'm, I'm hearing from you. Like uh, you, you mentioned inclusive, uh, cross-border work, uh, joint work, alignment, uh, community engagement. And, and I believe we, we, we could make so much use in Europe of um, mm -hmm. learning from our African Uh, colleagues and counterparts on on this uh, on how to manage a public health crisis with with this uh, with these elements that would uh, probably uh, help to enhance our response, don't you think? Yeah, in, in fact, uh, my my feeling is that <clears throat> because there is a, a recurrence of certain diseases here, like like yellow fever, like uh -huh. um, uh, measles, like cholera, uh, that. People here are good on responding because the, there is a recurrence, you know. So the, the risk is higher, but also the, the, the response is recurrent. So while for Europe, this might be a surprise of something that never happens, uh -huh. uh, here, here there is a dynamic. And in fact, the reason why it never happens in Europe is because people have a, a very short memory. It has happened many times. They have been in the year 166, there was the Anthony Plague and so on and so forth. So... Let's say that uh, it happens, but memory is short and people mm. forget. Okay, so a good learning for us, nurture the memory of, uh, of crisis on how we respond and what are the lessons we learn. Mm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, Jorge, I, I would like to, to, to make use that the, the, the connection is, uh, is still in our favor. And uh, ask you a little more. So, so here you're in Ebola, and, and, and we understand very clearly what, what is your role as um, WHO, Senior Health Advisor. And, and beyond this kind of, of settings, what, um, what else do you do? Uh, what, is your, what else do you do in your, in your job at uh, WHO? So I, I have been in WHO for the last five years. So I shifted from, from ECHO, where I was working as, as the uh, emergency uh, health emergencies, uh, medical focal point at the global level to support countries in WHO. But this support of countries has shifted during, during five years. Uh, at the beginning, I worked on creating the new program. So uh, the incident management system that I just mentioned was the product of a joint work where we took examples, for example, on, on how the firemen respond to, to forest fires, where you need people that arrive not to be idle and not to be a, a hindrance. So there are a number of rules and there is something called the incident command system, except that in the world of humanitarian, command does not work because people don't obey. So we, we shifted into a, a, an incident management system. And then I was one of the three first incident managers. So I did that part of the experience. So like the guinea pig, right? Uh -huh. and, and, and after. <laughs> Afterwards, a, a, an interesting shift happens because other than, than the new epidemic here or the cyclone there, there are the countries that have protracted emergencies that are old and big, like uh, uh, Northeastern Nigeria or Yemen or uh, uh, this type of emergencies. So we begin to work on, on concentration on some countries, right? And... Uh, and uh, Lately, what happened, when you support something for the long time, let's, let's imagine Burkina Faso. They, they had a, a, a strong deterioration already for a couple of years, but we know from experience that it's not going to end next year. It's going to take years because it's a conflict of, of resources or whatever. And whatever we do now will have positive or, or negative effects in the capacity that is local in five years or in 10 years. So how do you respond to a protracted crisis that is uh -huh. not substitution? So what I'm working now is to find the ways to be effective in the emergency, but, but doing so in such a way that it builds in the local capacities. 
and the system of supplies and health information and governance and so on. That's the type of work I'm doing now. Very interesting. Wow, fascinating. So really building the capacity. I love when you say uh, the, the um, no substitution, no? And I think that's been yeah. a big learning of the last years in, in humanitarian aid, because when we started, when you started before me, I mean, you have like 35 years of experience in, in public health and, and uh, in, in areas uh, affected by uh, crisis. And, uh, but I've seen uh, when, I, when, when we started, uh, it was a lot of uh, doing the job for others, no? And uh, now I, I like how we, we've learned to do also the job better, but uh, building capacity at the same time so that uh, people can do it. And, and as you were mentioning just before, they have so much experience, actually. So let, let's say that sometimes you need to substitute. Let's say that there is a hurricane uh -huh. in Mozambique that destroys everything. And then you will probably need to bring from outside a... Uh -huh. a, a a way to set up a, a warning and alert system for diseases and so on. So you might need in an acute response to substitute. But it is clear that if you substitute for more than three months, one year, three years, five years, the substitution is hard because it is going to obliterate local initiatives, right? And mm. therefore, it is not healthy to substitute in the long term. And therefore, you need to uh, begin to build on experience, there is nowhere where there are not excellent examples. So you can already start by a small excellent example and begin to expand using those local capacities in order to make sure that if by any, any, any circumstance you have to go, for example, for a security incident, what is left behind is better than what's, what was there uh, during the acute response. So there is no dependency and that, that's it, yes. Oh, I thank you, Jorge. And, and um, yes, yeah, that, that's very interesting how, how we, we, we still work on these phases, no, in, in terms of uh, humanitarian aid. What, what are the phases that you, you choose? You say, you know, if we substitute more than three months, do you have this sort of uh, diagram uh, in, in timeline in the, in the head or, or, or does it just come naturally based on context analysis? So, so if everything that has to do with the conflict uh, probably is going to last very long time. So, so you, you must from the very beginning, uh, in fact, you should do it always, right? Because there uh -huh. will be anyhow a future. After a hurricane, there will be a reconstruction. But indeed, if you take 100 types of emergencies, you can put it on, on six blocks that are uh, similar in, the, in terms of the need for response. So you will have, for example, everything that is uh, um, hydrometeorological, in cyclone or a flood, etc. That is going to be one group, and it's uh, a of a relatively short response. You have everything that is uh, geophysical and earthquake that will need a huge rapid substitution. Yeah. You will have uh, a, the infectious diseases that, contrary to what people believe are a bit slower because you know that there have been a, a group of people that died, but you don't really know of what and it takes time to, to find out and to verify the diagnosis. Then there are the um, climatic, the slow drop, etc. That is very forgotten because people don't invest until they see the impact. And while these ones could be prevented, they are rarely prevented. Then there are those that are technological, human, and like a nuclear accident, these type of things. And finally, there is the conflict and uh, have a very uh, long-term vision of what you're going to do, which is what I'm doing in Sahel, for example, in support of the countries. Okay. Thank you so much, Jorge. I'm seeing the, the connection is starting to, to get tired. I suggest that um, we cut our conversation here from the field, but we, we're going back and we're getting back to you in uh, two weeks' time. We're going to, to, to fix the time. So from your office in Geneva, that's going to give us also another angle of what is the work uh, to be, I mean, the work of uh, senior health advisor at WHO, you know, this uh, field part and this office part. Okay, and this is the right moment because the train is passing. It's going to be a crazy <laughs> noise. <very cool. laughs> okay.